Cast. If you're watching along, I'll say this in the um, syntax of one of my favorite old vintage YouTube series, if you can. Is it worship? That's the question for any of you Will It Blend fans out there. Um, that was one of the original wormholes I used to go down many years ago. Uh, but welcome to the official PresbyCast WrestleMania preview show. Uh, we've got a great cast with us today. We are going to, over the next four hours, break down every single match on the show, what it could mean for the future of the company, and then we, just like WrestleMania, we will be back tomorrow night for the night two preview as well, because it's just so big you have to do it in two nights. So uh, everything I said, of course, is a lie. Uh, we're, we've got some other people on the show to apparently talk about things that might be important. Uh, so it's a good one. This I, I was thinking about it as I was like looking at the topic. I also, uh, which is rare for me, actually skimmed <laughs> the material before this episode. Usually... I don't know. Uh, could be could be sanctification. Jury is still out deliberating. Um, but this feels like a show that would have happened in like one of the early years of Presby Cast. And I don't know that I have a higher compliment for a topic and or panel. Now, we couldn't have done this show back then because I don't think Google Hangouts could take that many people on a single call, nor did I have the bandwidth to support it. So... Um, you know, sanctification, like my bandwidth, is progressive uh, and continuing, and I look forward to see what we'll do, uh, you know, five, six years from now. Yeah, up and down, one step forward, two steps back, or maybe two, one, I don't know. That's not the topic, but um, it, it is good to have uh, ev everyone with us. We may be joined by one other gentleman if he, uh, if he gets together and joins us, but we've got the A-team here. And let me just uh, sort of uh, introduce everyone. We've got, um, I don't know, Zach, is this the second or third time you've been on? Z uh, second time, Zach Bird from uh, Mississippi. He's a PCA minister. We try to cover as much as NAPARC as possible here. We've got Harrison Perkins, who's been a PCA minister in uh, another country. Uh, he was he was a Free Church of Scotland, serving a Free Church of Scotland church in London, which is even more confusing, but now he's back in the U.S. He's in Michigan, which is like the Scotland of... No, it's not. Michigan's not the uh, Scotland of anything. The, uh, the only free church of Scotland in the U.S. is uh, is just down the road from us. Oh, I didn't... Well, I didn't it kind I of didn't, is. I didn't know that. Okay. Well, I hope you have happy uh, relations with them. So, uh, And then uh, Aaron DeBoer, who uh, this is not confusing either... Dutch guy, uh, he's a member of a presbytery in Mississippi of the Associate, Associate Reformed Presbyterian Church, and he serves in Washington State. So, uh, so for anyone keeping along, you're you're already you know, trying to follow along. You're already lost. We've we've um, done college football's done so much conference realignment anymore. You know, uh, USC and UCLA are in the Big Ten. 
Cal is playing in the very, you know, when you think of the Atlantic Coast Conference, you, of course, think about uh, Berkeley, California, and the <laughs> University of California. So, I mean, we're, we've, I think we're, I think we're accustomed to conference realignment. Uh, it's important to note that all of these men did it all for the money as well. If, if they have one thing in common, it's their, uh, their profit motivated first and foremost, for sure. Yeah, we've got some high rollers here. Uh, no doubt about that. I mean, well, Aaron has a private ski resort on his property. <laughs> we we can't just let that, you know, go unmentioned. Cats out of the bag. <laughs> <laughs> we, we've got to we've got to do a whole show with Aaron sometime just for to explain his um, his crazy Presbyterian life up there in the um, in the mountains. Um, and what mountains are those? Is that Cascades? North Cascades Range. Yeah. Okay. All right. I wasn't even wasn't even sure, but that uh, that sounds sounds right to me. So, um, well, here we are. We're going to talk about uh, worship. Now, we've talked about worship before, but as our um, well, I won't say most, but many Presbycasts are about um, things that have happened to one of us and things that we're thinking about. And I recently was traveling to visit relatives somewhere in the southeast, mid-south, I won't say where, and um, I had a choice of going to the local PCA church, but I thought, you know, I'm visiting, visiting these relatives for just a couple of days, I should go to church with them. And uh, boy, I did, and it was, um, I thought it might be a flashback to my Baptist youth, but uh, it was uh, an experience of the Baptist present which um, I was not uh, not altogether thrilled with. It prompted uh, a little article, uh, my reflections on this, and uh, things that I've I've mentioned before about um, well, all all almost all worship now is uh, it's it's mega church worship, or it, it it's aping the mega church, the the broader evangelical church. And I've asked before is. Are our neighbors that worship at a lot of these churches, uh, are they a mission field for us? Um, is there more to uh, the Christian life and the church than um, than just a, a, a bare grasp of evangelical doctrine? Uh, what's going on uh, in our neighbors' uh, churches and in their lives, really, in their church lives? So I think it's an important question. I don't think many people are talking about it. Uh, we tend to be minim uh, American Christians tend to be minimalists, uh, not maximalists on things like this, and um, uh, it's just it's a vexing issue to me. And this is not a you know we're uh, fancy reform guys and we know what's up, uh, and we're looking down on others. That's not it at all. It's trying to understand uh, the importance of worship what it is, and um, whether we should be uh, concerned about these things. So um, before we, before we, uh, we, we don't have to go through the article, uh, but I've, I've been criticized recently for, uh, you know, talking about the mission of the church and, and being very concerned about what the New Testament says about what the Christian church uh, should, uh, should do and how, how the church should conceive of itself. Uh, we don't have a New Testament book of Leviticus, uh, but the New Testament does say some things about worship, um, and uh, we need to talk about, uh, you know, when we talk about the regulative principle of worship, what what parts of the Bible and what passages are regulating it. So, um, Harrison, since you're a bona fide scholar, uh, let me just let me know if you think you've ended up in the wrong place or if you have concerns similar to this. Uh, well, um, I, I was glad that uh, for at least the time being, our other guest wasn't here so that I, I would only have uh, four people smarter than me for the moment. Uh, whenever he shows up, they'll be they'll be fine. <laughs> um, you know, I, I do have these concerns. And I mean, we've when I've been on the show before, we've spoken about worship by and large. And um I was actually just uh, finishing up an essay. So the, um, the, the faculty of Edinburgh Seminary, which I, I'm an adjunct um, at best, 
uh, there is trying to put together a volume of essays on ecclesiology. Um, and like I'm attached to that, yeah, I mean, we've sort of advertised that I'm OPC, but the real OPC guys probably think I'm still like a piece of PCA lint in the OPC pocket. Um, there you go. Great analogy. Here. Um, and I was just putting together an essay, finishing it up this morning, actually, and, and trying to articulate, uh, okay, what is discipleship like as the church does it we we have we tend to have this um, idea of discipleship as activities that we do uh, and what i try to articulate in this essay is actually that theology the means of grace and worship are the the key aspects of of christian discipleship now that that certainly forms us to be a certain kind of people and to do certain kind of things but if we think about the Great Commission, and so, I mean, this this plants it in your New Testament concern, right? Um, when when Christ gives the, the mission and the method uh, in, in Matthew 28, he says, disciple all the nations by baptizing them and by teaching them to obey all that I have commanded. Now, you've got word in sacrament right there. Um, so means of grace are the method for accomplishing the mission. But more uh, more directly to this point of discipleship, why is this important? Well, uh, in as much as it tells us the mission, it also tells us something about what it means to be a disciple. And interestingly, uh, it means to be a baptized person and to be a person being, being instructed. So you, you've got passive voice, as editors will hate, right? All across the board, but to be a disciple is to be a recipient, um, mm -hmm. and and so there is this characteristic of well the mission, but also the description of a disciple is somebody being formed under the means of great, having been brought into the covenant community and being shaped uh, by the word of God um, as it is administered through proclamation and in sacrament. Um, and and this is about advancing the the kingdom of God. Um, now, there there are some other thoughts that can nuance this because I mean I'm not in the place yet where uh, I want to say the people who don't understand the regulative pr principle in the way I do aren't um, real churches. <laughs> um, and I think our confession has some help for this that maybe we can come to later. But in terms of what you had mentioned there about we don't want to be just grumpy reformed guys criticizing everybody, um, Westminster Larger Catechism asks uh, us, what do we pray for in the second petition? Uh, 191, what do we pray for in the second petition of the Lord's Prayer? Uh, which the second petition is thy kingdom come. Uh, and it's acknowledging ourselves and all mankind to be by nature under the dominion of sin and Satan. We pray that the kingdom of sin and Satan may be destroyed. The gospel propagated throughout the world. The Jews called the fullness of the Gentiles brought in. The church furnished with all gospel officers and ordinances purged, purged from corruption countenanced and maintained by the civil magistrate, that's an interesting one, uh, <laughs> that the ordinances of Christ may be purely dispensed and made effectual to the converting of those that are yet in their sins and the confirming, comforting, and building up of those that are already converted. Now, the, the one I want to latch on to is that we're supposed to pray for the pure dispensation of Christ's ordinances that they might, one, be pure, and two, effectual, uh, both for unbelievers to come to Christ and believers to be built up in Christ. So this is not just a matter of getting it right. This is a matter of prayer. Um, we ought to pray that we are pure in doing these things. And certainly if we think people are incorrect, rather than just bludgeoning them with facts, well, we ought to be praying for them. Um, and so I, I hope that gets us some thoughts going, just connecting the dots on what you were yeah. you, You've described the ordinary means of grace. Um, so we, we should want our neighbors and our relatives um, and the people we work with um, to benefit from the meat, from, they, to, to, to receive grace. 
Uh, and if we believe literally that the means of grace are a means, uh, are is is the channel, uh, the delivery system uh, for this grace, um, we should do that right. Uh, so it's not just doctrine, uh, reformed, certainly you know Calvinism. Even you know we some people Calvinism can be shorthand for the five points and soteriology, but there's so much more to it than that, and we can't stop at doctrine. If uh, doxology and, uh, and you know we we we're not pietists, but we want piety. Uh, we're not moralist, uh, but we want uh, we want moral improvement of our people. But the way to get those things is with the what you call what you've described here, which I'm going to use the you know the standard confessional SPCA term, the ordinary means of grace. Uh, in in saying it's ordinary. Uh, that reminds us it's not really that complicated. It's not unattainable. Uh, you just have to you have to believe that um, that it's needed, and that's the way it ought to be to be done. Um, so, uh, Aaron, from your uh, from your Dutch background, what would you add on this? Because there's a there's certainly a particular Dutch piety, and um, we know that it's a, a rich thing. Yeah, my mind wasn't really tracking there. I was I was with Harrison completely on and had been meditating on the same thing today. And 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 I, so I'll go to my Hebrew ancestors, our true fathers in the faith, uh, because the redeemed psalmist was was still saying the same thing in the 119th, "Teach me thy statutes." It, it's always been a, a, a spirit filled person is hungering for God's instruction that we might reverently approach and. And begin to experience his benefits. Um, you know, with with regard to to the piety of the Dutch, there's it has waxed and it has waned, but certainly where it has uh, been preserved um, confessionally, it's 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 rooted in instruction in the law and the gospel and catechesis and uh, psalmody and and all of those things. And so we still see, um, I think, in in the confessional circles that that being preserved in a in a warm way. Well, now you mentioned uh, the Hebrews, and I was thinking today, um, because, you know, if you take the regulative principle seriously, you've got to grapple with what the New Testament um, uh, commands and, uh, and, and that we see in narrative, uh, models and commands. Uh, and this may be controversial, and you may not all agree with it, but I think it's fair to say, and it makes sense to me, that the synagogue model that was extant in the first century is much more of a model for the New Testament church, and it you know some of the synagogues just flip to become Christian churches. Um, but what we see there is, uh, as Harrison mentioned in the Great Commission, the teaching. You always saw teaching and reading. We can assume they sang psalms, uh, but we see the, the 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 teaching and we see the reading. So if we look at our evangelical uh, neighbors' churches. And they don't read scripture, and what happens in that um, second half of the service does not teach anyone anything. Um, that should be alarming to us, uh, to some degree. So the synagogue, you know, um, thinking about the synagogue model is an important thing. We see Jesus reading in the synagogue. We see Paul teaching in the synagogue, and we see, you know, if you look at it carefully, there were officials in the synagogue. There were officers. Uh, there was a structure of some kind. Now, there were hypocrites and Pharisees and terrible people in the synagogues too, um, but that's not all there was. And uh, so the, the simple synagogue model, uh, we ought to see some echo of that in our uh, churches today. Uh, Zach, before we go to our, our latecomer, any thoughts uh, at this point from you? Go ahead and unmute yourself there, Zach. I'd mute as you. The, as the smallest piece of lint in the collective PCA lint in the OPC pocket, I have I have a couple thoughts. I, and I'm thinking in terms of, of Titus 1. He says, truth is unto godliness. And there's an aspect in which our worship should both inform and transform together. And as a recovering Baptist, I know very well the emotional, fluffy worship. You know, you sing the same seven words 11 times. Uh, it does neither. And we're really shortchanging our people. 
Uh, it's interesting to me that I have done countless funerals. I have never heard a Toby Mac song sang at a funeral. Wait till mine. <laughs> no, no, don't. <laughs> uh, don't. Wait, don't listen to it or don't wait for yours? I'm, uh, oh. Either. Either. Okay. Either. Uh, and so it's interesting. Those are not the places we go for comfort. So why are those the places we want to lead our people to holiness? If the truth is to tra inform and transform, our worship should do the same thing. All right, doc, Dr. Clark, uh, let's do a sound check on you. You're here, and you know, as a professional podcaster, the irony is we usually have more trouble with your audio than anyone else's. <laughs> I, I, am I okay? Yeah, you actually, I think you are for once. Okay, very well, very good. good. Well, that's because I took it off of multi-channel. That's that was our problem last time. So sorry okay. about that. Oh, uh, we sound best in mono. <laughs> yeah, don't we all? Um, I, I want to uh, tag along with a couple of things that that you said, Brad, about the the synagogue. Uh, that's that's not a speculation that you were making. Uh, that's a reformed argument that was made in the classical reform period. Uh, there's actually a, an English translation of a treatise uh, by Vitringa, uh, where he argues that the pattern for early Christian worship was the synagogue. And there's uh, some evidence for that. In fact, uh, people who study uh, early Christian worship, and I have read a good bit of that literature, um, recognize the, the connection between the synagogue and early Christian worship, because the early Christians did not seek to replicate the um, uh, temple. They uh, sought to uh, imitate and adapt the synagogue. And by the way, there's relatively little singing in the synagogue and relatively little singing in early Christian worship. Uh, there's, it's, it's a hard question. I've been working on it off and on for years. Um, the secondary literature is very confused and confusing about exactly what was sung in early Christian literature, or, or early Christian worship and the liturgy. Uh, I know that in the 4th century, there was some debate about whether things other than psalms could be sung. One uh, synod saying yes, one synod saying no, and, and then a subsequent synod saying yes. So we know that was debated. Uh, but but uh, it's becoming clear to me that, that we sang relatively little. And then just recently, I was working on the, the um, Strasbourg liturgy from 1545, and there's... Uh, even if you include the Lord's Supper liturgy, there's relatively little singing. Um, it's So it's very distinct from uh, contemporary worship, which, as you observed in your article, is, I think, or, um, uh, that, uh, you know, what's happening in a lot of contemporary services is just an adaptation of the 19th century revival service. So what I say to the students is you sing them for 30 minutes and then you preach them, that bipartite structure is not our structure. Um, our, our structure is dialogic. And um, so anyway, I just think that's interesting that um, that it was very logocentric, both in the synagogue, in early Christian worship, um, where, by the way, they used no worship, no, sorry, they used no instruments um, until the, traditionally, until the 8th century. Wait, One they, organ, didn't even, they didn't even blow the shofar? Not in early Christian worship, no. Not that Gosh. I know of. So, oh, well, no that's dis disappointing. Um, so let, let's talk about music just a little bit then. Um, the, you know, the, the triggering event, the, the, the Southern Baptist worship service I went to, I, I only remembered four pieces of music, but I didn't want to say anything in the article that wasn't true, so I went back and, and re-listened or watched on YouTube the whole service. And I think there were about five pieces of music, and they were. I remember when they when it was clear they were going to go from one song right into another. I I died inside a little, as they say. The medley. Um, but there was. Um, I tuned out. I tuned out on the worship uh, the music. Now, ostensibly, every piece of music was for the congregation to sing along, um, but no one sang. I mean, I was at the early service with the old people, who, none of whom probably knew or. Or, um, or cared about this music. And I, I would say if 5% of the people were singing, that was, that was the high side. Hmm. And 
that was just demoralizing to me. Uh, just uh, couldn't believe it. So, uh, and, and I don't feel bad for for wanting better um, for them than that. Um, so, uh, let let's talk about music a little bit. I mean, my own church we do about we do uh, three pieces of music, not counting the doxology. Um, usually about fifty fifty if you average it out, psalms and hymns. Uh, it's maybe a third. Uh, maybe a, maybe a little bit less than a third of the, of the service, um, but that's just not typical. And uh, this does come from from revivalism, as you say. And I think someone's asking, "How was the volume of the singing?" Well, I couldn't hear any except for the um, except for the the uh, the praise team, uh, which because of the you know which Sunday of the year it was, it was pretty elaborate, but. We're not supposed to be sung at. We're supposed to sing together. And I'm sure you've all heard this. People will visit a, um, a Nay Park church and are utterly shocked by the volume of the singing yeah. and the fact that everyone's that everyone sings. And I think that, I think that's a that's a huge selling point. It, it may alarm people, but it it certainly is it's it's speaking to them. It's uh, it stands out. So. Thoughts on uh, music and singing. If worship is dialogic, and this our singing is is our response uh, back to God, then Calvin it, said it was prayer. Exactly, it ought to be hearty, heartfelt, and uh, and vigorous, and 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 I would say approved by God. Going to Harrison's comments about the um, regulative principle. I know that's a minority position, but be it be that as it may, um, I think that's I think because we do tend when we're when we're structuring our services the way that um, is we should, and when we are at our best, because we have this dialogic principle, um, the people are engaged. Um, uh, it's not entertainment. Um, it's not uh, performance. Um, it's part of our. Uh, face-to-face uh, engagement with the living God. And so when the Word of God has been spoken, read, preached, administered, you know, in Holy Communion, um, and then what can you do as a, as a Christ-confessing, you know, m- member of the, of the Church but respond uh, enthusiastically, uh, you know, and, uh, with, with the Word of God? Uh, that's why. That's why I think, in, in whether we realize it or not, why singing is often so different in Nay Park churches than it is elsewhere. Uh, Zach, you're in a small church, and so I'm sure the volume is not all you could wish it to be. Uh, how do you deal with that? Do people you just sing anyway? I mean, that's just the that's the strategy, right? Just do it. Actually, in our church, the acoustics are incredible. And from the pulpit, it is deafening because almost all of my people sing. If you have 50 to 70 people singing in a small building, it's pretty, it's pretty loud. Oh, that's, that's good. Good to hear. But it's interesting to the comment that someone made. We've had several Baptist converts because they go to churches where the music is too loud, where they can't sing, where 80% of people aren't singing anyway. And it's songs they've never heard. And they say, Zach, do you sing out of a book? We do. That We're hooked. We're Presbyterian. You sing out of a book. So it's been great. We're converting Baptists left and right by singing out of books. Well, here, that, that deserves a, uh, <laughs> a, a matron horn. So, and that's my contention. It's, it's the best advertisement that we have. Uh, people singing because it's not done anymore. Uh-uh. It's just not a so. phrase, a phrase that we use in our church to help people understand when they come in, but also just to kind of maintain the ethos that we're convicted about is that our church be an otherworldly church. Mm-hmm. And so we're, we're young and we're a plant. So we're only three and a half years old and we've been discipling people in from the outside or who have been unchurched for a long time. And, we had in 
in, we intended to move towards exclusive psalmody, and we've landed there. And we also we we did not intend necessarily to be a cappella, but providentially, the Lord has not brought musicians. So uh, wow. I wasn't necessarily convictional about that. I've grown in that throughout my ministry now with those those wonderful arguments that can be made. But when someone comes in at first, it's very strange. There's a man with a Bible and a Psalter, and but he loves that Bible and that Psalter, and he trusts it, and he's capable of explaining it. And when someone is, when, when you tell them, this is the singable portion of God's inspired word that he gave to us, and it dawns on someone, and they begin to experience that communion with the Holy Spirit in that moment with, like you say, in our church too, the whole flock singing, um, it, it truly is a, a different experience than they have had in any form of um, American Christianity heretofore. And now, now your 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 argument is a little bit more theological than mine. Uh, when I sing, one of my churches is a cappella, the other is not. When I sing, I sound like a donkey caught in a bear trap. And so my people know <laughs> if they don't sing loud enough, they'll have to hear me sing. That's all, all, all creatures, great and small, Zach. That's right. Well, that was, I mean, the the singing part. I mean, we a lot of our churches. Uh, were you, you know, planted, you know, prior to COVID was a reason that folks were coming to some PNR churches as well, was that insistence on, you know, the continued uh, communal singing as well. I mean, we have, I know for a fact, we've got at least a couple, um, a couple couples who had, who had joined our ranks because we were the church that was open and a church during COVID. Mm -hmm. I, I a think big part up, of that is singing. Yeah. Well, I, th I think to pick up on, on one of the really key things that Aaron was hitting at, at the end of what he was saying is uh, everything happening in our worship service is a, a theological event. I mean, if we believe that we are called in, into the divine throne room through the call to worship um, and, and, and then that being means of grace churches is not is not just about getting all the line items correct. You know, it's not just about being right. It's about what are the things that God has promised to use and do something uh, as we do them, and and to yeah to be that guy um, that maybe uh, Brad will sympathize with with me in trying to appeal to the New Testament. It's funny, Paul talks about this even in terms of singing, Colossians 3, uh -huh. right? Um, he, so starting in verse 14, and above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony, and which I, even as I read that, I, interestingly, is a musical idea. Uh, and let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. Now, one of the things that kind of like the string of participial uh, clauses there, I think one of the things that doesn't come out is um, it, it, often Paul tells us how to do what he instructs us to do. Mm -hmm. um, and so, one, he's he's leading with this idea of love one another, be this body where love is becoming more and more harmonious and welling up and be one body and be thankful. Well, how do we do that? Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. How? By teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom. Now, well, how do we do that to one another? By singing. Yeah. By singing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Now, a third of us, uh, Dr. Clark and I have a particular view of what that means, at least, and, and maybe some of the others are with us. But but apart from how you we should sketch songs, that out, right? So just so everybody knows the, that um, until the modern period, we all more or less knew what psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs meant. Uh, these are categories in the Septuagint. So when mm -hmm. Paul lists these out, and, and I've heard this, actually, I've heard it in a, in a Reformed pulpit, uh, said that psalms are psalms, hymns are, you know, what we think of as non-canonical hymns, and spiritual songs are essentially choruses. I've heard that in the pulpit. That's not right at all. 
There's no basis for that in Colossians. Um, first of all, it's grossly anachronistic, right? You can't read what we do back into the first century. Secondly, Paul didn't invent these categories. There are four, at least four kinds of Psalms in the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible. And Psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs are three of those four categories, and he probably is implying the fourth. Um, I have an article um, from Confessional Presbyterian where I break down all those categories. Um, yeah. I, it's available for free on Academia. Paul, uh, something about Paul and the Septuagint Psalter. Um, and, and I give a chart of all the uses. Not that yeah. that's interesting, but I want no, to. No, it's important. So that people know that this isn't just arbitrary and because I've, when I first heard this and then for years, you know, people mocked it. Oh, you just, it just means Psalm, Psalms and Psalms. Uh, <laughs> and, you know, that's how it was, that's how it was put well, to me. Well, if it's the, if this it's command the is the means by which yeah. the word of Christ would dwell in us richly, right. it would in fact make sense that the thing we are singing is the word of Christ. And it's not the word of Isaac Watts. Yeah, uh, right. and, but but without getting, I mean, yeah, I'm a hundred percent. Can I can I tell a story, and I'll then I'll shut up. No, about, hold on, I'm gonna I'm gonna tell one first. The singing the singing was so bad at the church service that I was at. I found myself. How longing. bad was it? It was so bad. I was longing for a Getty song to sing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so a, a few years ago, um, Chris had us sing. Uh, our pastor, uh, Chris Gordon, had us sing um, a, a psalm, and I, he he's told me which one it was, and I, to my shame, I don't remember. I, it was in the 120s. And um, uh, we sang an a cappella, and um, before, I think in the second stanza slash verse, um, the co members of the congregation were reduced to tears. It was the single most powerful religious experience in corporate worship I've ever had. And we were it, singing a psalm a cappella. And the reason was as if the, the things that God gives us could yeah, have, exactly. have have these transformative uh, mm -hmm. effects upon us without and, and us I, making things up. I have sung with, you know, covenanters who, if you want to know how to sing, sing with covenanters, you know, and, and maybe that's true in the ARP too, because they, they have that tradition. But, uh, it was it was amazing, and the the power of it was that we could hear each other singing God's word. You know, when the organ is cranking away and the piano is going, you know, especially with the organ, we have we have wonderful musicians in our congregation. Um, but when the organ's going, you know, it's the dominant voice, uh -huh. and and we're we're supplementary. Uh, but when it's when we're singing a cappella then uh, we are the voice we are the instrument and and it is uh it, it's an amazing existential experience um, and, and that was the experience of the apostles that was the experience of the ancient church and um because and, in the means of grace i mean if we believe or at least if if you if i'm right about colossians 3 16 right uh, singing is an address to one another singing is an a, uh, is instruction and admonishment to one another that causes yeah. the word of christ to dwell in us richly richly right now i mean that's that's not a because so many times i think people think this is stodgy and stingy and boring and i always say look at the word that i'm richly yeah that theological realities would would belong to us in a rich way. Singing does this under There's God, a, and so we ought to do it well. I mean, not not in the sense of train ourselves with how to you know sing a ton of parts and that kind of things. I have my misgivings, in fact, about that yeah. for various reasons. But um, if we are means of grace churches, we we don't sing just because. Um, well, it says sing. Uh, we sing also because this is part of the means of grace structure. It is prayer. Um, it is prayer set to a tune that that is doing something theological. And so it's not just about me and what song I like. It's about all of us. And it's about all of us under the Lord as we encounter him in his throne. I know I, know you made fun of encounter Brad, but um, you can make fun of me too. And that's fine. <laughs> no, I, I just heard a lot about, we were going to encounter something today. And I certainly did. And uh, yeah. 
there, therein is the contrast. So if we take the Lord at his word in Colossians and again in Ephesians 5, and that it is catechesis, and we take the imperative references in book four of the Psalms that, that we must sing these Psalms, that's the contrast between uh, the encounter. That So in, in, a, in a modern context, people are being catechized in amusement or stimulus or therapy, whereas in the ancient apostolical context, they're being catechized with the Spirit of God, the Word of God, neighbor fellowship, just, just all kinds of sweet, sweet uniformity there as, as, as he designed. Imagine going out and planting churches where you didn't have to worry about finding a first-class musician or hiring um, a pagan to play the musical instrument for your church plant. I mean, I'm, again, I'm not saying this would be easy. I'm not saying that this would be uh, meet the tests of the church growth gurus. But I just wonder how the ancient church did this. And I'm talking about the ancient post-apostolic church. Yeah, you know, as we think about the culture becoming more and more hostile to Christianity and uh, living in a post-Christian culture and world, how are we going to adapt to that? Well, we can look to the pattern of the ancient church and say, well, how did they do that? Uh, they gathered uh, secretly in the second century, and uh, and they sang, uh, as, as best I know, uh, God's word. Maybe not exclusively, I can't prove that, but certainly at least some of what they sang was God's word back to him. Um, and as I say, you know, without instruments. You, you know what I find you know what I uh, okay. let me let me tell you something I find distracting, and this was this I didn't mention it in the in the article. Um, but you know, when they've got those drummer cages, uh the, the Lucite uh, drummer enclosures, I always wonder how bad does it smell in there? Because you know, <laughs> Drummers, I mean, think about it. <laughs> Terrible. <laughs> so, Zach, I, I'm sure you were going to talk about the, the scent of musicians and, and drummer cages. That's exactly right. Uh, well, something more, a lot more memorable. Um, my country church, most of them did not grow up Christian, not from Christian homes. So if I say, can you give me a scripture reference? Uh about the importance of scripture can't give it but they can sing me how firm a foundation give me a bible verse on god's faithfulness most of them are in their 80s they can't can you sing great is thy faithfulness boom and so it is reinforcing these deep scriptural truths in in ways and categories that some people in the day and age when we barely can remember our wives cell phone numbers in a powerful way. Uh, it has huge pastoral implications. May, may I tell a story, Brad? Please. Um, I, I took a trip to Southwest Hungary oh. um, a few years back, and I was actually preaching in a gypsy village. Um, now, these are people who sell their windows to have food. Um, or or other things, um, and some of them were Christians. And I find myself in the middle of this field, uh, and it dawns on me that we're we're about to have a service, right? Um, and I'm supposed to preach the word of God, and we're going to sing. Uh, and it and it dawns on me that despite the fact that we are in a place in the world where no one is aware of it. <laughs> Uh, and and it is forgotten by many things. By and I'm among people who are disliked by everyone around them. And I and I preach uh, from Ephesians about uh, how there is one blood, right? And and I tell them I I've come to Hungary because I want to visit my family and that they're my family. And to say that to a group of Romani gypsies, um, I I actually did not realize how profound that was going to be for them um, before I said it. But regardless of all these trappings, um, we were about to do the highest thing that was possible to do for humans. Worship the living God. Now, uh, together as his people. And, and we have to ask ourselves, okay, well, one, how kind is the Lord that he has made the universe in such a way 
that we actually can do the highest thing that we were made to do without even having a society to transform. <laughs> uh, <laughs> If you're in the if you're in a field in a gypsy village, you know that there is no society to transform in a sense, right? Um, we can still do the highest thing that we were made to do. Um, and second, we can do it without lots of fancy things. And in fact, if we believe in the sufficiency of scripture, regardless of if you believe that we we can have other songs from outside of scripture, or if we may, uh, sorry. Scott, um, <laughs> uh, regardless of if you believe if we may have uh, <laughs> scripture or songs that are non-canonical songs, if we believe in the sufficiency of scripture, we ought to believe that everything we need is there. Amen. And and we have we have you know we trust the Lord that He gave us even the songbook that we would need to do the highest thing that we could possibly do, really in any setting. And that has left a mark on me for a number, well, since it happened, um, that there is very little that we need to accomplish the highest human reality that can be done. Um, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer, and to praise choruses. And well, the they, had the, they, they had the CCLI license, though, so they were Interpretive legal. Interpretive dances. At least. Interpretive dancing. Uh, liturgical so, ballet. So here's the question. Here's something that I knew this. I mean, I grew up Southern Baptist. I know that for many Southern Baptists, Sunday school is more important than the church, than the worship service. In fact, when I was last teaching Southern Baptist Sunday school in the 90s, I mentioned this very recently. I'm sure uh, you you know you had a you had a picture of the head of the Sunday school board on the back cover, and there's a quote there, and he's saying that um, Sunday school is our primary means of evangelism. Um, so they knew that people prioritized that, uh, and and now maybe I I would say that in many ways that small groups have replaced Sunday school. And so the priority of worship is something that we need to emphasize. We're talking about our neighbors. How do we explain it to them? When you say that the most important thing the church does is on Sunday morning and Sunday evening when we gather to worship, they may look at you like you're from another uh, ecclesiastical planet because you are. You are. Uh, yeah, exactly. Yes. Yeah. Because what, you know, Sunday night is for uh, small groups or or doing what you want to do. Uh, sometime during the week, you you know, Tuesday night, you meet with your small group. I mean, my own parents, they they value their friend group and their, you know, you have age segregation uh, in most uh, evangelical churches, interest groups, affinity groups. They meet together in Sunday school or small groups or, or sometime. And people are lonely today. I mean, society is a mess. People do need that sort of thing, and we need to work. We need to be conscious of providing fellowship opportunities, uh, the communion of the saints, all that. But it should grow out of the worship service. It shouldn't be next to or above or even nearly as important. I mean, I, I know you, probably one of you guys has said this before, but we have we have 30 minutes between Sunday school and worship. That's all fellowship time. Uh, and then people, you know, if, if you if you draw the unfortunate uh, straw of locking up the building, you're going to be there at least an hour after the morning service because people hang around. That's when fellowship happens and at other natural, you know, organic times. But it's not the main thing. So let, let's talk about the priority of worship. Now, we can point to Shorter Catechism 1 and say, look, there's, you know, there it is. Uh, glorifying God is more important than anything else. But how do we, how do we communicate that to our, to I mean, going to church every Sunday morning and evening if you can, that's good because people say, well, what did you do this weekend? I said, well, you know, that's Friday and Saturday. Yesterday, the first day of the week, I spent with my church family as I always do, and that might cause them to look at you like a, a weirdo too. But what about the priority of worship? 
I think for, that it's uh, really vitally important that we communicate that to people, that the, the central act of being a Christian, really, is gathering on the Lord's Day, the Christian Sabbath, for corporate worship. It, um, it It's really hard to overstate the, the importance of that, you know, so I was having a little fun with Acts 2.42, but, you know, that's typically, and I think correctly taken, to refer to the pattern of Christians gathering on the first day of the week. And so everything you said is exactly right, Brad, that, that this was the pattern of the early Christians. The apostolic Christians, the early post-apostolic Christians, um, was to gather on Sunday, you know, and they did it twice, every every Sunday, every Lord's Day, early in the morning, and then again uh, in the evening. Um, and um, typically in, in post-apostolic worship, in out-of-the-way places, uh, because they were an illegal uh, religion. Uh, and and uh, this idea of being devoted to the apostles' teaching, did you notice, as I you know, was reading Acts 2.42, how word-centered that is? It's not the only thing that takes place. Prayer is part of that. Sacraments are part of that. Um, but there's nothing in there about singing. Um, so our, you know, anyway, our priority of, uh, on singing is, is I think, somewhat out of whack, but um, out of step with the ancient church, for sure. Um, but the, um, the act of gathering together, where we, as a corporate body, meet with the living God, and He meets with us, maybe even more importantly, um, is, um, is astounding. And um, you know, I, I I remember I was a Southern Baptist, I, not not uh, formally, but that's where I that was the context in which I came to faith. And you're exactly right about Sunday school. Um, I mean, it, it was in a sense th- that congregation was more of a of a, a missions agency than a, in a, in a you know th- that was everything. Um, and you know there was some commendable zeal for that, but there was not much as, uh, of a sense. In fact, I'll I'll, I'll say this. When I left the Southern Baptist and I went across town to the German Reformed Church, I was struck by the dramatic differences between the the sort of folksy, relaxed, um, entertaining quality of the Southern Baptist service and the rather ser- more serious approach to worship at the in the German Reformed Church, at St. John's Reformed Church. Uh, I went with a buddy. I, I met up with him. And um, I kind of cracked a joke about one of the uh, hymns that we were singing, and he looked at me and he shook his head and he said quietly, "We we don't do that here." <laughs> and we had, the thing is that at the Southern Baptist Church we did that all the time, you know. Um, it was a different culture because I, for the first time in my Christian life, I had this uh, growing sense that something um, awesome, something sacred, was transpiring. And uh, there was this exchange going on, and that we were being included. Um, and, and this is where God meets with His people. I don't see how anything could be more important to the Christian life than that. Yeah, and what you said about it being a kind of a missional organization or meeting, that harkens to what I said in my piece. I said, uh, I asked the question, was it Christian worship? Um, and I said, I don't think so. And so I asked, what was it? And I wrote, the 70-minute-long Sunday morning gathering can best be described as a Christian, that's using Christian as an adjective, inspirational, motivational, organizational meeting with musical performance interludes. Um, So it's not that there's not a Christian element, uh, but the goal is, is, is to motivate people to do things. Uh, and there's there are a lot of announcements. That was my point in calling it an organizational meeting. Uh, a lot of it's about informing this captive audience who's already on board. You're marketing to yourself. Um, so uh, motivational, uh, organizational, and inspirational, which is the music is somehow supposed to inspire us to worship. Um, now, commendably, there were no video clips. There was no light show. There was no fog machine. But everything was, you know, the goal of everything was to, um, was, was well, a lot of it was an emotional, there was an emotional uh, response that was, uh, that was desi- de- desired. And that was uh, a lot of the goal of what was going on. So I don't say they weren't Christians. 
uh, and that they weren't doing Christian things, but for because of the liturgy uh, and because of you know reverence and and the the amount of scripture that was in there, I don't really think it was a Christian worship service. So let's let's grapple with that. Uh, how do we deal with our neighbors or uh, you know unbelievers who grew up in churches but they've never worshipped according to scripture? How, how do, what do we say to these people? Can I jump in? Uh, I live in a, I'm, I'm pastoring in a town of 1,940 people. Between me, the Methodists, and the Baptists, there's probably 500 that worship on Sunday. I live in what I call the Baptist captivity. Now, outside of the Baptists, the Medes and Pentecostals are starting to take over. So there's a huge Pentecostal influence. And well, what you, I, said, you said the Medes. Well, I thought it, you were going to say the Medes and the Persians. Yeah, the Medes and the Pentecostals. Uh, they're overtaking the Babylonian Baptist. So, okay. Uh, what I find is most of them have never had an honest thought of what Scripture says about worship. They love the Lord, but it's not talked about in their pulpits. They've never put any conscience effort in it. And so when you begin bringing up these issues, it is like speaking in another language. What I have found effective is two things. Um, I meet with a group of pastors in my office every Friday at 7 o'clock, and we talk about these issues. And like my Methodist brother has started incorporating the confession of sin in his worship services. Where did he get the confessions of sin? From me. So he's using P Presbyterian confessions of sins in his Methodist church. I'm not sure how that works out. Um, but we're beginning to have honest conversations. The second thing is constantly pointing people in conversation to the words of Scripture. Psalm 19 says it enlightens the mind. They have zeal without knowledge. What they need more than anything is for the Scripture to enlighten their mind to see this is who our God is. This is how he is to be worshipped. And it has provoked a lot of conversations in three years. Yeah, There's and, a Baptist lectionary. Yeah. Uh, I mean, and it's unintentional, but there's a Baptist lectionary that effectively exclu excludes um, great chunks of Scripture. And when I went off to seminary, and, and even before that, started reading Scripture more holistically, more organically and and contextually, it was um, a revolution in my life. So that's something to which we can expose people uh -huh. um, uh -huh. is, hey, you know, this uh, verse that we're discussing, you know, here's the context for this verse, and here's the actual intent. Uh, I, I used to carry around a verse pack from the Navigators, you know, I had lots of them, and we, you know, memorized those verses, but they were completely decontextualized, and I didn't really have any idea what they meant. And it was revolutionary to, to run across those verses in their context to realize, well, no, this, this means something entirely different. So I'm, I'm agreeing with you a hundred percent, Zach, that I, I had a, I had a conversation with the Baptist convert and she said, Zach, we never talk about worship in the Baptist church. And I said, I asked her, I said, well, tell me about your former pastor's sermons. And they were all over the Bible. He had never preached expositionally through a book of the Bible. So obviously they're not being, she's not hearing or being influenced on what scripture says about these key topics. You know, to Brad, to sort of draw the line back to, I mean, that, I really appreciate the practical way you're coming at that, Zach. Um, and we do, um, despite the flack he's gotten um, recently on Twitter, w we all need to be more like Lig Duncan, right? I mean, gracious always. Uh -huh. um, and and to draw the line back to the principal question, like Zach has, has outlined some really helpful ways to come at this. And the principle, so um, the the confession gives us help. This is this is what I was um, sort of hinting earlier on. So chapter 25, um, which is on, on the church, mm -hmm. uh, and paragraph four, mm -hmm. 
the Catholic Church, small c, <laughs> uh, has been sometimes more, sometimes less visible. And particular churches, which are members thereof, you know, the big one, the universal church, are more or less pure uh, according as the doctrine of the gospel is taught and embraced, ordinances administered, and public worship performed more or less purely in them. Now, mm -hmm. what, what I think is really fascinating right there is you have, when it comes to the public ordinances, you actually have two layers of more or less pure. Uh -huh. um, the church can be more or less pure. Uh, and part of that is the more or less pure uh, delivery uh, or performance of public worship. And, and then it's interesting also that paragraph five starts, the purest churches under heaven are subject both to mixture and error. So mm -hmm. how do we reckon in principle with that issue? Was this worship? Um, you know, it's a, it's a strident thing to say no. <laughs> as, much as, as much as like I have a lot of sympathy with, with that, um, that man is, but is there anything left? <laughs> um, maybe, maybe it is really far down on the less pure scale of how they are performing public worship. And that, that might even have a really hard dent that it's put in, in it being a less pure church. Um, that could, but it, but it might still be <laughs> that, the gospel is is delivered, um, and that and that some semblance of worship is there. Um, James Usher, if I can, if I can sort of pull, if I can, if I can put a saddle on my hobby horse uh, for for just a second, I, I did my doctoral work on on Usher, and there I've got this volume of translations that's coming out later this year, and and so I've been sitting in this section that he has on the visible church, um, and he he talks about the visible church. Being called visible, he says, on account of the whole mode of its ministry, which is external and able to be seen, he goes on to talk about how uh, anyone can point a finger at it <laughs> when the church is not the true or perpetual one. Um, and then he says, so then some churches uh, are more or less pure than others who more or less practice this administration by God's institutions. Um, now it's interesting. Before I read the next bit, Usher's writing this. He's these are lectures to to seminary students essentially during the English Civil War. He's giving these lectures in Oxford while the Westminster Assembly is meeting. Um, so you've got the the Puritan Party uh, of Puritan, uh, whatever that means. Um, the Parliamentarians meeting in London, um, outlining the things in the Westminster Confession. Uh, and he is is an Anglican, for lack of a better term, uh, and yet still wrestling with the Laudians who are imposing stacks and stacks of ceremonies. And and if you replace surpluses with skinny jeans, um, and, you know you, you've essentially got a Laudian regime today. Uh, in the Why United not States. both? Why not both, Harrison? Why not both? Why not both? Well, one would cover the other. And he goes on to so anyway, he's he's dealing with. Lots of things being imposed on the church that he thinks are not pure. And he says, the churches, nevertheless, must be assessed by whatever substance of the gospel ministry they retain and by what are called foundations. And if the entire ministry of the gospel is obstructed for certain reasons, then they would not receive it. Or because they lost that ministry, they practice it less Purely, so he admits there is a way in which the entire gospel can be obstructed by by what people do less purely in worship, yeah. and he still is trying to hold on to this thread. Where, but if the gospel is there, <laughs> I think Harris is being too charitable. So I'm mm -hmm. I'm going to be the mean guy here. I think Harris is being a little too charitable, and and here's here's why. Um, I, I, I'm not denigrating the sincerity of those people. I love those folks at the SBC where I came to faith. They, they were, they were Christian people who loved the Lord, loved me, uh, loved the Word, loved the gospel, and so I'm I'm affirming all of that. But was was that uh, organization actually a church in which worship was uh, 
in which they were attempting to worship. And um, I don't think that the divines were actually intending um, in 25.4 to countenance the Baptist. And maybe I'm influenced by the fact that I'm reading uh, Featley's uh, um, The Dippers Dipped, which if you translate the Greek a little less politely, because the, the dipped, the, the Greek word, the adjective for dipped there is, is onomatopoetic for uh, the, the, the uh, catabaptists is what it says, spat upon. Is, <laughs> that's what the Greek says. And he's quite vigorous, uh, is featly. Another, another Episcopalian, another Anglican uh, going, after, um, going after Kiffin, whom, whom he calls a catabaptist. And um, he, anyway, so they had a very, uh, they were, conf what's, what I think is interesting about the, this treatise is it's one of the earliest encounters between uh, Reformed Orthodoxy and, and the early particular Baptist movement. And mm -hmm. it, gets, it gets discounted, right? Oh, well, this is over the top. This is mean. Well, um, uh, anyway, um, so we early on uh, took a very uh, dim view. And then I go to Belgic 29. And so I, I'm conscious that this is the Presby cast and not the Belgic cast. Uh, but um, Belgic 29 uh, addresses this question of how we discern whether an, an organization is actually a church. Um, and it says the true church can be recognized if it has the following marks, right? The, it engages in the pure preaching of the gospel. Okay, well, I think that was there in my uh, Southern Baptist congregation. It makes use of the pure administration of the sacraments as Christ in, instituted them. Well, uh, that, that's somewhat problematic, or I'd say seriously problematic. And then third, it practices church discipline for correcting faults, and I don't have any knowledge one way or the other, whether that took place. I'm not aware that it took place. It may have, I don't know. But but certainly, manifestly, by our lights, um, that, you know, my Southern Baptist congregation did not administer the sacraments as Christ instituted them and therefore lacks one of the marks of the true church, um, which then places in jeopardy uh, what, they're, what they're doing. Um, anyway, so it's worth considering, and I think, uh, based on what I'm seeing in Featley, um, and I think it's you could probably find it in Robert Bailey as well, um, that they that they might agree with the the Belgic on that, for what it's worth. Well, in in the in the defense of the mean guys, let me read my my last two uh, paragraphs, which probably can you know we react to these. It'll probably fill the rest of our time, um, but uh, note note the adjectives and the. Uh, uh, this covers a range. Uh, there, uh, I certainly say that uh, these are usually Christian churches. We need to grapple with the fact that many of our neighbors do not participate in distinctly Christian worship, even if they regularly attend a Christian church. They may have attached themselves to an organization with more or less Christian aims. They may hear Christian sermons or talks, and they may listen to or even sing uh, with the choir uh, Christian music, but they may not be confessed. Now, now I get into the Reformed elements that a Reformed person misses so much in evangelical worship. They may not be confessing their sins, learning the essentials of the faith, or gaining an understanding of biblical truth about our triune God or the saving work of Christ. We need to remember that. So let me stop there. Um, I didn't hear anything about the Trinity at the church that I went to. Mm. The doctrine of God, uh, theology proper, is is almost unknown in the evangelical church. And when they do it, it's often deficient. Um, um, Marshall McLuhan said the medium is the message. Uh, the very structure of the service, the, the tone, the visuals, the informality or formality, uh, the kind of music, all these things, they 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 are catechizing us about God. Is God holy, or is He just like us? Is He other, or is He just a, a great, you know, a, the the best possible grandfather? You know, which is it? Uh, so there's 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 the finer points, there's the doctrine, there's the elements, but the 
everything is telling is teaching us something and we're communicating something by participating in it so, worship uh, is discipleship absolutely i mean that that was where where i started some of my points right um worship is the foremost thing that disciples us and one of the, one of, frankly one of the reasons why i hang on to the more or less pure things uh is be is not necessarily about the baptist but um I realize there are things that I think aren't pure <laughs> in in the worship that we have. Okay, Harrison. Harrison is saying is talking, saying that the only pure church is more or less pure, the OPC, uh, right? Uh, well, the PCA is pretty close, also. Um, <laughs> even if we're the only perfect church, so. <laughs> well, I, I think that's an important point. We have to be careful not to have an overrealized eschatology and and become practically Baptist ourselves and say, well, this, this congregation isn't getting everything right, therefore I'm out, and I'm, right. you know, I'm leaving, separating, you know, because that's, because um, that really would be contrary to the spirit of, of 25-4. So, so that's right. I mean, so that's, that's kind of where I'm hanging on, is not so much like, well, how much room can I buy um, for, for the guys that I think I, I don't know how I could, you know, really think that this is worship, you know, but at the same time, according to my own conscience, uh, I, I'm not worshiping according to my own conscience in full uh, in the church where I pastor <laughs> um, and, and don't know that I ever will. And that's fine. I'm in submission to my session. It maybe it's not fine, but, you know, um, we make these decisions together the best we can. Um, one of the things, though, about discipleship in, in terms of worship is um, and I learned this from Scott as, as he taught me how to translate texts, right? He, he told me um, a translation is an exercise in sanctification because you have to submit to the grammar. And that um, he probably doesn't remember saying that, but I remember sitting in his office and, and that struck me that sanctification is so much about learning submission. And so we have to ask this question. If worship is for our sanctification, if it's for equipping us, right, even even to use evangelical parlance, um, okay, well, well, equip us for what? I think a lot of people think worship means give me a euphoric experience that's uh -huh. good enough to get yeah. me to the next one. Exactly. Um, but but that is an actual training. That doesn't train you to go do so. so how does worship train us in submission? as sanctification, right? And if it's everything we want, if it, if we like it all, we're not being trained in submission. Or mortification, uh, so, yeah, or, right. or vivification. So, so, so part of me wants to say, you don't like something about your church service? Good. Learn to die to yourself. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's right. You, you, you don't always say what you want. Well, I think the other part is I go back to Bannerman, and he says, you know, the one mark of the church is does it bear witness to the truth? And our sanctification rises or falls according to our understanding of the truth. Right, and if they're not that. getting it on Sunday morning, it is going to directly affect their sanctification. Right. What is true, of this is. is true of the members of said body. The, right. We don't. We don't do the the like the the pattern, the mm -hmm. rhythm of praise the Lord, confess your sin, believe the gospel, just for the heck of it. Um, that is something that we're trying to train people to do. I don't I don't want the members of my church to wake up any other day of the week and think that they have to invent what the Christian experience is like today. I want them to have taken away uh, from worship what the the motions, the rhythms, the routines of what they do every day. Wake up, you praise the Lord, you confess your sin, you believe the gospel. And just like you go to the gym and you pick up a really heavy weight so that when you go to, out into the world, it's easier to pick up something out there because you've done this compressed, intensified version. Worship is, is discipline in the same way. Here's a compressed, intensified experience of praise the Lord, confess your sin, believe the gospel. Um, so that when you go back into the world, you know not how to do other things, but how to praise the Lord, confess your sin, believe the gospel. Um, it, it is supposed to drill into us these, these. Um, I mean, it ought to be reflexes if done rightly. Um, it, it is supposed to ingrain into us. So, I mean, imbue us into the, to the very core of our bones. 
60 years of a sanctified variety show has done us no favors. Yeah, exactly. Hear, uh, right. So I'm, we're I'm, all I'm, discipled somehow. And what, how, yeah. how is the question? Okay. And let I'm, me just say, if you pick up heavy weights once a week, you'll look like this. Okay. <laughs> I that out there. okay I, I want to hear from Aaron because I always like it when he, when he has something to say, but he's so polite. He's not saying that much. Well, but Aaron, I, I can see the wheels turning in your head. Yeah, um, well, I, just where you were at just a few moments ago, you talked about conversing with your neighbor. You talked about theology proper. And immediately I, I thought of a conversation that Sproul had in his unique way. And he was describing a conversation that he had with an individual in the 80s who was you know, surveying the Chicago suburbs for what people wanted and what they were dissatisfied with in worship. And they, they all said they were bored and it was dirgy. And if, if you're in the know, you kind of know he's, he's talking about Bill Hybels and he's talking about Willow Creek. And, and Sproul heard him out and, and listened to his innovations and so forth. And then he just simply said, when I encounter the living God in the holy word of God, I see people doing one of three things. They, they either weep, tremble, or die. And we've lost sight perhaps of the first assembly where there's a 7,000 foot mountain that's smoking like a kiln uh -huh. and a uh, people who were called out for worship. So they were, the Pharaoh was told they had to go out for worship, a peculiar treasure that just was in awe. Amen. They would, they would live through a, a slaughter of, of thousands by their priests because of their unholiness. I mean, and so then when, and I mentioned that book four of the Psalms and when you, when you read 95 through a hundred, just as you're, you can uh -huh. formulate almost, a regulative principle of worship in, in Psalm 95 through 100. And it's bow, it's tremble. Um, and, and it has all, it has many other elements, including uh, exclusive, exclusive psalmody. Um, but that, that awe and our friends, Dr. Hart and John Meather wrote a book about that. Um, and so I think in, con in conversation with our friends and neighbors who are still caught up in this entertainment schema, we who, who really have maybe even they're being told, did God really say, I, I, you know, at an extreme, the normative principle of worship, which is to say that if it's not prohibited, we can do it is to say, did God really say? And so we can have conversations about the lawgiver who is the savior of the world um, and, and describe everything he has commanded. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, let, let, let me read, let me read my last paragraph real quick. And again, I'm not saying these aren't Christian churches or that there's no Christian worship going on. It, I use the word distinctly, and this this is as a Reformed person. If I go to a worship service and there's no call to worship, and there's no confession of sin, and there's no there's not more than two verses of Scripture read, we don't say the Lord's Prayer. I'm not saying you have to do every one of these things. We don't confess the creed or an ancient creed. And then if the sermon is not very biblical and then there's no benediction, um, that might be why I feel like there's nothing I can really identify as, as true Christian worship going on. But don't don't hear me saying what I'm not saying. Uh, I'm not saying that um, you have to worship perfectly to worship because we can't. Uh, the confession of sin that we say uh, includes all the sins of the Lord's Day and our inadequate worship. But let me read this, this uh, short paragraph. Let me close with a neighborly analogy. The concern for our evangelical neighbors and what happens in their churches is not like we're offended by our neighbors, our real physical neighbors, overgrown yard or you know all the weeds in it or their, their paint is tacky, it's a, it's, a, it's a gaudy color or it's peeling off so it looks run down. It's not like that. It's more like we're noticing that the foundations of their houses have problems and maybe that they're near collapse or that their children don't seem to be uh, being fed regularly or properly or enough or that no one's protecting those kids. Um, so think about that in churchly terms. Uh, last sentence, worship and the biblical means of grace are matters of spiritual and eternal life and death. Uh, we're not saying you're saved by worshiping properly, but your discipleship, your growth in grace, your protection in this world between now 
uh, in this time between the times um, is very much dependent on on the means of grace and proper worship. So I don't want to sound too harsh. No, that was that was a, that made the piece, Brad. I commend you for that paragraph because it it actually has a pastoral tone to it too. Um, that these and I, and I've sensed that in you before and things you've discussed on the podcast and have tweeted before that what we're finding is the the mega church or the or the mainstream it is a tremendous mission field and it is time for a a reformation. It is it's not the same as the fifth at the 16th century, but it has elements of of ignorance and innovation and superstition and false assurance that. Uh, that these people need to be snatched from the fire. Yeah, and false assurance is, is you know, it's not just them. Um, but also, I mean, we can gain assurance with the, with the ordinary means of grace. Uh, if, if we direct, if we look away from ourselves and up and out and to God and not only in ourselves, maybe, you know, the, that's the beautiful thing about a, a good reformed liturgy is it's it's horizontal, it's vertical, uh, it's, uh, it's 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 introspective, but it's primarily focused on the truths about God, and um, well, you, you can't beat that. So as we you know we, we'll go another few minutes, but uh, just anything, uh, Zach, I think you had something to say. Well, I, I love your word concern. Um, when I talk to others about worship in a small town, my goal is not for them to hear I'm Presbyterian and you're not. My goal is for them to hear I am concerned for your soul. I am wanting to have these conversations because I love you and I want to see you grow in the comfort and joy of holiness. And how we worship impacts that severely. Um, and so there has to be, along with the precision and the principle, the heart that has a longing for the salvation of souls that goes along with communicating this and that warm and with that warm and winsome concern. Because it's easy for me to say, uh, you know, somebody comes in my office and occasionally, if I know them really well, I end the conversation and I say, look, we do this. You do things your way. I'll do things God's way. And we laugh and they get tickled. But that's never going to win somebody over. And that's yeah. not going to sanctify their souls. But but that's actually incredibly important. The thing you, yes. you said there, um, because I mean, if we tie that into i mean you know um i i i appreciate those last two paragraphs brad i mean i i'm not used to being the guy who's more charitable although if, if scott tells me i've been too mean sometimes i think maybe i've hit the right note um i i agree with everything right there um but as as you've just hit that note zach i think it's really helpful to remind ourselves th those big structures of worship and discipleship hanging together. Okay. What, what are we being discipled in, uh, you know, unto? Um, and, and if we think that w we don't need to, to bow the knee about what our entire service looks like, um, that teach that that on its own teaches us something as we worship. Uh -huh. um, it it teaches people at least implicitly that as they go into the world, they should expect God to mold His providence around what they like and and what they wish would happen, rather than well embrace God's providence as He gives it to you because He is good. Uh -huh. um, you know, the regulative principle is not just about, and, and perhaps this is really where I was trying to get in my other earlier comments about trying to be a little bit sympathetic is, is not giving them place to continue to do what they do, but um, really just recognizing that, well, we've, we've got to appeal to something. Uh -huh. um, and, and we, we all have to learn to, to submit ourselves to the Lord because he has good things to give us. Uh, and as, I mean, I, I have reflected on John six 
uh, over and over in the last couple of years. And it strikes me um, when you get to the end of this passage, uh, Jesus has given this big message that is is um, predominated by the theme of election. Um, and a lot of disciples leave. Um, and and then he turns to, to the 12 and asks, are you going to leave too? Uh -huh. And Peter says, I loved everything you said. I'm not going anywhere. Um, no, <laughs> Peter... I mean, you can, I mean, even as you read words on a page, you can, you can sense the concession. Where else would we go? You have the words of eternal life. There, there's a submission to what the Lord Jesus has given him. Mm -hmm. He doesn't know exactly how to accept it. He knows that he needs to accept it. He knows that even when he cannot see it, that it is good. And we have to learn that. And we have to learn that through worship and instruction in worship and through the means of grace in worship, rather than being taught that God is about to shape the world to be everything you like it to be. I mean, that's a that's just a bougie version of the prosperity gospel, right? <laughs> uh, and that's not what means of grace churches are supposed to be. This shapes us and teaches us that not only how we learn to submit in worship, teaches us to submit to God's providence in the rest of life too. Uh, and yeah, that is for our good. Speaking yeah. of submission and what you're what what you've said, Harrison, we hear a lot about contextualization. Uh, and that can justify nearly anything, but I, I think we should push back. And when we hear the word contextualization, we say, you know what the context of a Christian church is? It's the Bible. It's 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 actually you know, and, and the, the context for a Reformed Church is Reformed doctrine and worship. Uh, it's it, we we we're not. It's not all infinitely adjustable, and there none of it, and it's not optional. And um, you know, the, what I didn't really reflect it in the piece, but my real concern is I'm in this church service, and I'm s next to a a young person, and they looked completely confused and flummoxed by everything that was going on. Uh, and I thought, this is, the old people didn't like it, the young people didn't like it. Apparently I wasn't, I wasn't with the crowd, that, uh, that it was, uh, it, it was, it was just disturbing because I thought this is not what it ought to be. And it's not good for these people. And, and if nobody's going to like it, it at least ought to be biblical. Yeah, <laughs> yes. that's a great point. If you're going to offend people, might as well do so on God's behalf rather than on some pragmatic agenda. I, I want to, one last thing I want to say, I want to commend Zach for talking to other pastors and for building those relationships and, and communicating some of these things uh, to, to those brothers. Uh, that's how reformation happens. Uh -huh. uh, you know, a, a, a Methodist who maybe has never encountered some of these things uh, finds out about uh, you know the Reformed Confession of Sin, you know whether it's Calvin's or the you know, Book of Common Prayer or whatever, um, and and begins incorporating that, you know, the, one thing leads to another, and and in the history of the church, that is one way that Reformation has happened. Those kinds of uh, discussions. And I'm writing that in my journal. R. Scott Clark said something nice about me tonight. Check. <laughs> so I, I would say. Be confident. Um, in our church, we've got people that have come from very um, missional, progressive PCA churches, and they're happy. We've got people that have come from unbelief or Pentecostalism or the broadest evangelical churches. Um, this is not a barrier. There, there's no barrier here. Um, this is a good thing. We, we, we want to explain it. We want to model it. We want to do it uh, and do it confidently. Uh, explain it as we go sometimes, but uh, but this is not anything to be. We shouldn't. This is just not. This is not a boat anchor. Uh, reformed biblical worship is is it's it's the boat. Okay, it's not a problem. Uh, it, it's uh, it's a blessing that we should uh, we should work to uh, to enjoy and to uh, and to propagate. So, any uh, closing words from anyone? I think uh, you're. Uh, you all are exactly what I what I hoped you would be, and uh, I knew we knew we had the right guys together uh, for this topic. So, Aaron. Yeah, thank you, Brad. I appreciate the confident note. You know, um, 
Ephesians 4 tells us that, that the ascended Christ, the coronated Lord of glory, has ascended to the heavens that he might fill all things, and he is doing so through the church. And he gave the church the apostles and the prophets and the shepherds and the teachers for equipping and to bring us to maturity. So if we hold fast to the teaching of the prophets and the apostles, Christ is going to fill the whole earth with his church. Uh, and it is glorious. Yeah, Stuart Robinson, you know, Stuart Robinson had the, the title of the book on the church, uh, the church, an essential element of the gospel mm -hmm. of God. Uh, well, worship is for the, you know, worship is uh, the church's thing. And uh, when, when you could say that worship is an element of the gospel, it is, it is good news to us that we're called to worship. It's why the call to worship is so important. And, um, yeah, it's just, um, I don't know, be weird. If this is weird, just be weird. Uh, be weird about um, about uh, the church and uh, uh, the worship of the church. So any, any other very quick words from anyone? Any notes? Thank you, brothers. Uh, I appreciate the invitation. So God bless you. Yeah, yeah thanks, even, Brad. This has been great. Uh, yeah. I mean, maybe one thing to think, because— one of the questions may be sitting here at that what if we're, what if we're not there what if what if we don't have that if if this had, if this issue is about sanctification remember that sanctification is progressive um, if if you're a pastor and your people come to you and ask a question why do we do this and it seems co confrontational uh, maybe even combative um, that's okay you don't have to go back to them and just expect them to be there. Believe that these things are good. And so teach them and teach teach them about how these things are good for them. So we, we um, sometimes reformed churches expect people to come prepackaged reformed. Um, um, and and we gotta we have to learn to enjoy helping people become reformed. Um, and and so embrace, sanctification uh, through the means of grace and even embrace sanctification as we teach about what the means of grace and the regulative principle are. Thanks, Brad. It's always, it's always great to be with you, really. And and you, brothers, I, I appreciate your spirit and, and what you do. Yep. Thanks to everyone. And I think our outro music is sort of about sanctification. And uh, Resby, you uh, you had a lot to say at the beginning and, and less so since, but um, your words have weight because of their... Uh, the relative scarcity uh, or whatever. This was the worst WrestleMania preview show ever. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> so, uh, but no, thank you guys for, for joining Aaron and Harrison and Zach and, and Dr. Clark as well, even though he had to depart quite quickly. Um, thank you guys for coming. Um, this was, again, it, it seems like a, I said at the beginning, a, a show that we would have done in the early parts of Presby cast. And, uh, I like getting back to our roots. Um, cause it's, it's amazing to see that, you know, these things aren't, well, the answer to the problem is, you know, we've, we've discussed what the answer to the problem is throughout all of this, but the problem still persists. Like it just, it just keeps on going. And so, um, that's why we're here and bringing people together to, to talk through it. And uh, hopefully you enjoyed it. Um, is the music queued up? I'm not well, used to talking yeah, this long without it, music. It failed, so we'll just go out. We're not going to have <laughs> sanctification music. We're just going to have this old favorite. All right. Well, in that case, everybody, don't be an urban.
What's wrong with you people?